Welcome to everybody here in person and welcome to everybody online. We've had a really good attendance so far. Yesterday we had about 55 in person and we think as many as 70 online. So it is really good to be getting back in person. At least it makes my heart soar like an eagle. On behalf of the Lovers Lane Foundation, I'd like to welcome all of you, whether you're online or in person, to this year's Owen Linton Lecture Series. And more specifically, to day two of our Owen Linton Lecture Series. My name is Paul Ditto. I'm the Executive Director of the Lovers Lane Foundation. This lecture series is funded by the Foundation's Owen Linton Lecture Series Permanent Endowment, one of 42 permanent endowments of the Foundation. Each of those endowments benefits a specific aspect of our church and its ministries. In 1985, the Owen Linton Lecture Series was established as a permanent endowment by Babs Owen and her late husband, Arch Owen. Babs is home today watching this online. Yesterday, her caregiver, Meredith, was here. They've been such an instrumental part of our church. Thanks to their generosity, this is our 36th annual Owen Linton Lecture Series. As I mentioned to you yesterday, we'd probably not be here today if it were not for Arch and Babs Owen. You see, not only did they establish the permanent endowment that underwrites this lecture series, but they might should also be called the mama and the papa of the Lover's Lane Foundation. It was Arch Owen's idea not long after we moved to this location that we needed to start a foundation. And he and Babs spearheaded the formation of the Lover's Lane Foundation in 1981. In the beginning, Arch and Babs actually took turns serving as the board chair, going from one to the other every three years. So I know Babs is watching us online, so will you please join me in thanking Babs and posthumously Arch for being such an important part of our church. So from its meager beginnings in 1981, the foundation has grown steadily each year, thanks to many of you. Five years ago, the foundation's total assets were almost 13 million. No, nothing to sneeze about. But today, thanks to all of you, just five years later, the foundation has grown to more than $20 million. And last year, the foundation made grants to our church of in excess of $450,000. And this year, the foundation will make grants to our church and its ministries of more than half a million dollars. There's hardly a ministry in our church that the foundation does not help directly in some way. So we're really excited about our Owen Linton Lecture Series this year. Our overall theme is Community Heroes and Easter Faith. And we have three awesome speakers. Yesterday, Terry, uh, Terry Parsons brought our focus on the emotional stress that so many people, including many of us, have experienced this last year. And he left us with a message of hope that with God's help, we'd get through this. Then today, we'll hear from Chelsea White about food insecurity in our midst. That's a message I think will strike home to many of our hearts, knowing how committed our church is to our own food ministry. And finally, on Thursday, Laura Burnside will close us out with a message about heroes on the front line. And like yesterday, today, as well as tomorrow, we have complimentary take-home box lunches for each of you outside in Aldersgate Hall. Each day, any excess uh, box lunches are going to great causes. Um, today, any excess box lunches are going to the Cornerstone Kitchen in South Dallas. So let's get started. Andy, would you open us in prayer? Hello, my name is Andy Nelms, and I have the privilege of being an associate pastor here at Lover's Lane. Will you please join me in a word of prayer? God who fed the 5,000, we pray that your gifts would be multiplied here. 
God, in the same way that you took five loaves and two fish and fed a multitude of people. We pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would multiply our efforts. We pray that this would not be a moment of shame and guilt, but of empowerment and freedom. God, today we pray for our speaker. Or we pray that you would speak through Chelsea. We ask that through the power of the Holy Spirit, God, that, that what she speaks would be directly from your mouth. And God, we pray for those who are hungry today. We pray for those whose minds are occupied from where their next meal will come. God, yeah, we pray that you would feed them. By the miraculous power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would provide. And if it be possible, that you would use us. God, we pray for us who are gathered here. We pray that our bellies would groan for righteousness. That we would feast on the living word of God. And that we would obey a new commandment. That we love one another as you have loved us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you so much to Ryan and Cheryl for leading us in the beautiful music this morning. Our scripture that will center us from today comes from Proverbs chapter 31, verses 8 through 9. Speak out for those who cannot speak, for the rights of all the destitute. Speak out and judge righteously. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kay. I'm Randall Lucas, and I have the honor of, um, as Director of Missions and Outreach, to introduce our speaker for today, and um, that is Chelsea White. She is a recognized nonprofit leader committed to advocacy for social change south in South Dallas, Fair Park, and East Dallas. Rooted in a family that prioritized service over self, and watered down by the teaching of the Methodist Church in which she was raised, Chelsea is a truth teller, a social change agent, and a community servant. As a communicator, both by training and inclination, Chelsea uses her voice and life to speak on behalf of the voiceless. She has spent her career in nonprofit fundraising, working to make the world a more equitable and peaceful place. I am sure you've heard this saying regarding hunger. Feed a person to fish. Teach them how to fish. Chelsea adds, change the fishing industry. She believes it takes all three to alleviate hunger. Will you join me in welcoming Chelsea White? Afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be speaking in a pulpit. This is very humbling for me. Um, I grew up in a Methodist church, so I know my grandmother's very proud as she's streaming this. Um, so I was a very typical teenager. I, um, you know, was a pretty good kid. I grew up in the Methodist church, but I was still you know, focus more on who's going to make the basketball team than what's going on in society, like society's ills. But my junior year in high school, when I was 16, that changed slightly. I made an observation that I had no idea I would still be talking about many years later. I will not tell you how many years later it is. Uh, and, and something that people in America and the government and perhaps even globally, things that we're still grappling with. I took a child development class my junior year in high school, and I wasn't interested in child development, but I heard that Mrs. Rambo didn't give homework, so I was like, okay, whatever, we'll just, I'll take this. And part of what we had to do was every Thursday, um, each of us in the class had to visit a kindergarten class and help read with the kids. So I was assigned to Mrs. Winchie's first period kindergarten class. And in that class, there were two students who really stood out to me. There was a little girl named Stormy, who um, was just cute as a button. She'd come in, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Her father was an orthodontist. Her mother was a teacher. And, you know, her clothes would be neatly pressed, and she'd have the big bow that matched the shorts that matched the socks. And, of course, in her reading, she was just way ahead of everyone. She was very confident and, and peppy and just the cutest little thing. But then there was this little boy named David. And even as a 16-year-old, I could tell he was small for his age. He wasn't filthy, but he wasn't super clean. He was just unkempt. And remember, this is the first period of the, of the school day. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. He could never look me in the eye. I could barely hear him uh, when he would read. And he wasn't doing very well. He was way behind the rest of the other kids and certainly way behind Stormy. And one thing I noticed every single Thursday 
was his stomach growling. I remember it because it was so loud that he would get embarrassed. He embarrassed very easily. But every, every single Thursday, first period of the day, his stomach was growling. And I remember talking to uh, my family when I'd go home and talk about, oh gosh, you gotta see this little Stormy. She's just so cute and she's gonna really skate through school and she'll probably be a cheerleader and maybe she'll be in student council and she'll graduate, she'll go to college, possibly be a teacher like her mother, get married, have a white picket fence, two kids, a cat and a dog. Good for her. Her path is already set for her. But then I realized, wait a second, if her path is set for her, then David's path is set for him. She's going to have a wonderful life, and I hope he graduates high school. Probably not. These kids are five years old. I've, I've thought, I've considered, because I tell this story all the time, I've considered looking them up on Facebook just to see how each of them turned out. But on the one hand, I kind of don't want to know. And on the other hand, I already do. We know how these things turn out. It's a very accurate prediction. There are a number of, of different variables that set David up on a very different path than Stormy. No question, a lot of different variables. But I can promise you that at the center of that was food insecurity. Food insecurity is both a symptom of a number of issues and a cause of a number of other issues. What is food insecurity? It's loosely defined as lack of access to enough food to feed everyone in the household and the unavailability of substantial and nutritious food. So this took place in West Texas and in Dallas, food insecurity is way worse, notoriously worse. Um, according to Crossroads Community Services, the rate of food insecurity in Dallas is 47% higher than the national average. Dallas is notoriously segregated and has one of the greatest wealth gaps in America. Nowhere do you see this stark contrast more than in South Dallas. Now, I have worked in social justice my entire career. I know what food insecurity is, I know the stats, I know what it looks like, but not until COVID-19 hit Dallas last March did I really get a sense of what it might feel like on a visceral level. I live in Arlington and uh, COVID showed me the very, a very stark difference in my experience versus the experience of our neighbors in South Dallas. First of all, grocery store access. I have four grocery stores very close to my home. Three are walkable, I could walk to them. I'm not going to, but I could if I wanted to. Three are easily walkable. So right before COVID hit, I was in Boston for um, vacation. At that time, Massachusetts was under a state of emergency, so I knew how bad COVID was, but I was staying in a hotel. I, had, I didn't know anything about what was going on in grocery stores. So when I came back to Dallas, I landed and turned on my phone, and I had just panicked text messages from my mother, or bless her, probably in all caps, telling me to get to the grocery store. Okay, I'll go to the grocery store. And I walk in Whole Foods, and it, it just looked apocalyptic. There was a line to get in, first of all. It was packed. The, the fear inside was palpable, and shelves were cleared off. And of the food items left, it was like grass-fed T-bone steak. I did not have that in the budget. Ground beef is gone, pasta's gone, everything left is really expensive. I did not like buying grass-fed T-bone steaks, but I could do it. You know, we weren't gonna go hungry, so I did. In South Dallas, on the other hand, there is one grocery store in a two-mile radius. So even outside of COVID, inventory is low, it's 
poor quality, and shelves clear off, particularly when COVID first hit. Food pantries and food distribution centers just right after COVID hit skyrocketed in demand because of this, because everyone's going to one grocery store and there's nothing left. Of what's left, it's the more expensive items. So grocery store access is number one. Number two is vehicle access. I have a vehicle, not a nice vehicle, but it's a vehicle, gets me from point A to point B. So had I wanted to shop around for lower prices or better inventory, I could have driven around Arlington. I could have driven to Plano if I wanted to. I could have driven anywhere to shop around. I also could have gone to Costco, purchased in bulk, which would have saved me money and would have allowed me to stock up for a week or two so I wouldn't have had to get back out, you know, we're in a pandemic. Vehicle access in South Dallas is extremely low. So in normal times, to get to this one grocery store, you have to take a bus and you have to switch buses in downtown. That can easily take an hour, an hour and a half, assuming the buses are on time. Also, if you are taking public transportation to go to the grocery store, you're not buying bags of apples. That's too heavy. You're buying boxes of mac and cheese. You can carry that. You can only carry a few days worth of food, so you then have to go back out a few days later. And again, it's COVID, so that's not safe. Grocery store access, vehicle access. The third difference is safety. If for some reason I had to take a bus to a grocery store, I could, I mean, it would be inconvenient, but I could do it. I wouldn't have to worry about stray dogs. Um, I wouldn't have to worry about, you know, unsavory characters hanging around the bus stop. I, I wouldn't be unsafe. In South Dallas, stray dogs, for example, are actually a very big problem. It's usually pit bulls. They're actual stats about the number of dog bites. So you have to take a bus. You're, you have to kind of walk by groups of unsavory people and there's, you know, some stray pit bulls by the bus stop. That's not safe. So grocery store access, vehicle access, and safety are three of the many issues that cause a lack of food access. There are many more issues caused by lack of food access. Poor health outcomes, certainly. Senior citizens having to decide whether to purchase their medications or food, certainly. And then you have malnutrition in children. Certainly, they, are not, they don't develop physically as well, perhaps mentally. It's hard to learn when your belly is empty or if your belly is full of not nutritious foods, which then means it's hard to focus, which then can lead to behavioral problems or perceived behavioral problems, which then affects your academic success, which affects your success in your entire life. This was the case with little Dave. At five years old, he had been on earth for just five years. His path, his entire life's path was set long before he had a chance to earn success or earn failure. That's a broken system. I don't care what you say, that's a broken system. If you can accurately predict where a five-year-old is going to end up for the rest of their lives, that is a broken system. So why am I telling you this? What is the point? The point is, this is our responsibility to fix. Certainly our responsibility as humans, but definitely our responsibility as the hands and feet of Christ. Let's go back to the scripture. Speak up for the poor and helpless. This is the NLT version. Um, in my version, there's not a question mark in here. There's not an asterisk. It doesn't say, you know, if you want to, will you speak up for the poor and helpless? If it's convenient, would you mind doing that? If it's, if it's comfortable and you're not going to lose Facebook friends, would you mind, if you get around to it, speaking up for the poor and helpless? 
He doesn't say that. I think it's really crystal clear what we're supposed to do. And all of us struggle to speak up, myself included. I do this for a living. I still struggle, so no judgment from me. But we still have to do it. There are a number of ways to use your voice, number of ways to use your voice, particularly if you are a member of Lover's Lane United Methodist Church, number of ways. But I would say that your first step should be this. You should go to God in prayer and pray three different prayers. The first prayer is to ask God for understanding. Understanding that this is a broken system and that when people live in a broken system, they have to make broken decisions. We shouldn't judge that. We all struggle. I do too. But let's first ask for understanding. The next prayer should be to ask for God's guidance on what your role is. We all play a different role in this. Ask him what your role is. And the third prayer, which I think could be one of the most important, is to ask God for the courage and strength to speak up in whatever way he calls you to do so. Particularly if he calls you to speak truth to power. It's very difficult. You will need to be strong and brave like Joshua, I promise. I will leave you with this. This is my very favorite quote. I try to keep it in mind. I don't know the author of the quote, but it says, sometimes I'd like to ask God why he allows poverty, suffering, and injustice when he could do something about it. But I'm afraid he would ask me the same question. I'll step on your toes a little bit. We all have the power to do something about these things. That is how his power is used. Let us use that power the way he calls us to. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chelsea. What, a, what an important message to hear to continue our three-day journey focused on community heroes and Easter faith. In the middle of our three-day to get a challenge to speak up. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Matthew 25, and there's no asterisk in there either when it says, take care of the least of these. So before I turn it over to Cheryl and Ryan and uh, Randall, I want to point out that uh, in your program today is um, in the little blue box in the program is some information about the foundation. I hope you take a minute to read. It's uh, different than the blue box yesterday. It's additional information. Um, and if you were here yesterday, um, you'll remember that there's an insert today as well. It's the same one. On one side, it talks about Arch and Babs and and a thank you to, to them and a thank you to each of you. And then on the flip is some more information about the foundation. So take a minute to look that over. And uh, last but not least, on the back of our program is the remainder of our Holy Week schedule. And of course, I hope you can join us tomorrow at noon here for the last of our three days together in our Owen Linton Lecture Series. And we hope you can join us live and in person, that's live and in person, Thursday evening for our Monday Thursday concert, The Mystery. I'm so happy to be getting back to live and in person. And then please join us for our Good Friday service. Uh, it'll be online only, that's Friday evening at seven o'clock. And of course, join us in celebrating Easter this Sunday. We hope to see you at one of our many Easter services this Sunday. Last Sunday, we had a great turnout. It'll be even better this year. All those services are listed on the back of your program with all the additional information you would need. On behalf of the Lover's Lane Foundation, thank you for coming today, and thank you for tuning in online. Uh, I've enjoyed being with you. It was great to see your smiling faces and greet you. 
Um, we're we're going to reverse the order of the closing hymn and the benediction from what's in your program. So we'll, we'll uh, you know, first we'll have the hymn and then the benediction. So with that, uh, Cheryl and Ryan, will you take it away? Well, thank you. We would like to invite everyone to stand with us as we sing. Uh, I sing the almighty power of God. We will have the words on the screen that you can follow along. And we do ask that you stay masked as we sing together. Join us as we sing. Thank you, Ryan and Chelsea, for that challenge to speak up for the voiceless. Um, I challenge you to pray the prayer that she asked us to pray. For understanding, guidance, courage, and strength to speak up for the voiceless and truth to power. As we go from this place, may we be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a world that de so desperately needs hope. Let us be resurrection people. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. <laughs>